Is it a plane? Is it a tank? Is it a glider? Well, let's just say it's a combination of all three. The World War II era Antonov A-40 was a mind-boggling combination of machinery that was part plane, part tank, and even part glider too. The Nazis may have been the leaders in slightly demented military machinery during the Second World War, but this Soviet plane slash tank was right up there with some of the most optimistic and a little crazy Nazi German inventions. But if you could apply one rule to the Soviet or German crazy World War II project convention, that would be just because you can doesn't mean you should. Let's jump into it. I've covered quite a few weird and wacko flying machines on this channel, but as few as quite as weird and wacko as the one I'm going to talk with you about in this video. This one takes quite a bit of beating in the bizarro stakes, trust me. The concept of the Antonov A-40, which was sometimes referred to as the A-40T or KT, was actually quite simple. Devise an aircraft that doubled as an armoured vehicle too, so that it could swoop into a battle zone as quickly as possible, then once landed the aircraft could detach its wings and transform itself into a battle ready tank. However the chief purpose of the A-40, which the Russians dubbed the Krylia Tanka, or tank wings, was the ability to fly tanks into needed battlefields as quickly and efficiently as possible. Mobility and flexibility were key to the A-40 design concept. The assumption was that the flying tank could detach from its towing aircraft some 20 to 26 kilometers or 12 to 16 miles from the target, and then glide silently down into the battlefield where it would engage the enemy. The aircraft was specifically designed to operate as an engineless glider and thus fly stealthily and at low altitude into the combat zone. The bulk of the craft would be one of the lightest Soviet tanks available, the T-60. This particular light tank was considered an excellent choice by the Soviets given that it was easy to mass produce and could be assembled in automotive factories using a wide range of automotive production assemblies and parts. It was compact in its dimensions and had what was considered a manageable weight. Also the tank only required two crew members to commandeer it. On the ground, the tank could move up to a speed of 45 kilometers or 28 miles per hour, with a total of 6,045 T-60 tanks produced in the war from 1941 to 1945. But this special version would have had fabricated biplane wings attached to it, as well as a twin tail for much needed stabilization. The biplane wings were made of ultralight plywood and fabric, with a wingspan estimated to be just over 18 meters or 59 feet, as well as an overall area of 85 square meters or 900 23 square feet. Each biplane wing would be unstaggered and feature a pair of tail booms with twin vertical surfaces and a high mounted single horizontal surface. Aerodynamic controls for the craft comprised of a single lever that operated all flying surfaces from the driver's position. Or I suppose in this situation, the pilot technically. The A-40 would immediately drop the cradle to which the wings were attached once the tank was deployed onto the battlefield. The designer who dreamt up this mad design would be none other than, let's hope that I get this right, Oleg Konstantinovich Antonov. This was indeed the celebrated father of the Soviet Union's aviation industry, the very same after which so many famous Soviet area aircraft, both military and commercial, were named. Interestingly, until then Soviet forces had been strapping tanks and armoured cars to the bottom of TB3 bombers, and then dropping them from very short heights onto the ground. The tanks would not break apart on impact as long as the gears were in neutral. The drawback was that the tank crews had to be dropped separately from the tanks, which delayed the deployment of these tanks once they were on the ground. Also, the tanks being deployed were simply too small to be very effective in combat, nor was it worth risking a bomber just to put them into the battle. 
But why this need by the Soviets to deploy their tanks in such an unorthodox manner in which speed of deployment was everything? There's no denying that the Second World War was the veritable hothouse of some of the most inventive and daring aviation designs and engineer concepts ever devised. Necessity is the mother of invention, as the saying goes, and it wasn't only Nazi Germany that was desperate to gain the upper hand in the air during the war. The Soviet Union was waging a staggering bloody war against the Nazis on the Eastern Front and were equally desperate to attain any gains possible, including aerial advantage against the Nazi Germany's formidable Luftwaffe. And as already noted, the Nazis had their nimble powerhouse panzers on the ground that were proving a tough match for the Soviet forces. Nevertheless, defeat was not an option for the Soviets, which is why no military concept was off the table. By the way, the Soviets only commissioned this designer to build his flying tank in 1942, which coincided with some of the worst fighting of the German invasion of the Soviet Union. That leaves us with the question, what happened next to this flying tank design? The first prototype of the aircraft was built in 1942 and was indeed tested on September 2nd of that year. The pilot chosen for the A-40 test, Sergei Anohim, a famous Soviet experimental pilot. If anyone could pull it off, it was our man Sergei. Initially, the aircraft would need to be towed by another aircraft until it could glide down into the battlefield. There was just one little problem, gliding with a 5.8 ton tank attached to its wings is not the most aerodynamically thing to achieve. The test A-40 was to have been towed in the air by a Tupolev TB-3 bomber, however it wasn't exactly a success. Once the craft had reached around 160 km per hour, or just under 100 miles per hour, the sheer drag was simply too much for the wooden biplay wings. Sergei was losing control and was forced to ditch the wings and opt for a so-called soft landing inside of a six-ton tank. Whilst very shaken, he only suffered some light injuries, but was immediately detained by the Red Army soldiers at the ground who had not been advised of an odd-looking vehicle and declared it to be a combat danger. It was also reported that the TB-3 bomber towing the tank overheated itself and nearly failed immediately after takeoff. So why was the test such a failure? First, the wings were simply too big and not sturdy enough, since they were made out of wood. Second, it was necessary to remove ammunition and fuel from the tank in order to make it lighter for flight, which pretty much defeated the purpose of the tank as an all-out combat armoured vehicle. According to some sources, even the tank's turret was also removed in order to save on weight. That would be somewhat problematic for a tank driver in the heat of battle. A third reason for the A-40's failure is that the T-60 tank used could only be armed with a 20mm cannon and 10 to 25mm armour. The Soviet tank was simply too weak for its required role against powerful German tanks on the battlefield. It was later ascertained by the Soviet military analysts that a far more powerful aircraft would have been needed to raise the A-40 to the required height in flight. That aircraft would have been the PE-8, a powerful strategic bomber used by the Soviets for deep air raids and the bombing of Berlin during the war. But here's the catch. The Soviet Union only had 80 of these bombers, making the A-40 project even more logistically non-viable. That would be the one and only test done of the Russian flying tank. Even with the failure of the A-40, the Red Army continued to work in the field after the end of World War II, which resulted later during the Cold War in the successful family of tanks that it could be airdropped and which also have amphibious capabilities, the BMD. In the end, it seems, the flying tank concept wasn't that crazy or harebrained after all. Speaking of ideas that aren't that crazy or harebrained, Found and Explained is currently looking for new Patreons. That's right, you can become a sponsor of the channel yourself by going to our Patreon page or becoming a channel member if you prefer. This will give you access to videos early, behind the scenes, suggesting ideas and chatting with me directly. So jump it on and check it out. Thank you again so much for watching.